Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, who has not been to one of our lectures? All right, so some of you have, which is great news, because I'm going to be using some terminology that might be new. And the good news is the terminology is not really unique to this lecture. It's universal terminology when we start looking into some of the Taoist views and uh, Taoism. Uh, has anybody ever heard of Taoism? Yes. Yeah? yeah. And so there's a few ways to look at Taoism. There's a spiritual Taoist view, you know, very religious. Then there's a scientific Taoist view. There's a medical sign, you know, a Taoist view. What we're doing is a medical qigong, so it's really not the, so much the spiritual as it is looking at it from more like a, an equation, more like an alchemist, or more like a scientist. So some of the terminology, if I say something and you're like, wow, what does that even mean? This is live, interactive, and you're encouraged. I don't want to just talk at you. I'd like to talk with you. Just like we're hanging out, having a conversation, feel free to raise your hand. We'll turn the camera on you. No. <laughs> and then, it'll be it'll be good. Okay. First question that I have for everybody in the room, because I truly and sincerely have no idea. What the hell is this lecture about? <laughs> what, what's the, what, honestly, what's the title? I just what's it called? Mindfulness. Mindfulness is yeah. that what it's called? Golden, the golden, golden years. Thank you. Okay, now I'm ready. There's my prep. Uh, so let's look at that. And what does that even mean, which really ties into my opening statement about alchemy. So uh, the old phrase, alchemist, what is the old alchemist most famous for? Their big pursuit. Anyone? Let's see. Let's see. Lead into gold. Yes, that's the big one. Mixing lead into gold. Yes, of course. Only, but, you know, the old folklore of turning lead into gold. And that is such a wonderful analogy. And so I'm going to kind of build off of that and use that to effectively communicate the situation, our situation. So lead and gold. So in this view, lead would belong to the yin, okay? Turbid, chunk, lead. You know, think of it. Touch it, your hands get dirty even. Lead belongs to all of the lower, heavier, dimensions of our, even our own consciousness, lead. So lead is a lower consciousness, okay? Gold, well, higher consciousness, yeah. If you're in this room now, who here is over 58? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, it's hard to believe, it's really hard to believe, really. I think I'm, you know, really, so, okay. So, but, yeah, I know, who is it? Right, and so, okay. So, but let's talk about this because whether you know it or not, by virtue of the fact that you're sitting here and you're contemplating these things, and you're even going to take the time or have the time, the, the presence of mind and resources, you're already in the top, you know, 51%. It's just as far as your probably natural intuition and just kind of how you were raised or how you came in. Just know this. Most people are not sitting around on a Saturday afternoon contemplating the Tao. Yeah, they're dealing with usually lower thought form. This We're talking about cool, inspiring, uplifting growth. Most people, especially after 58, are going downward energetically, and it's usually about turbidity, looping a story, looping suffering mentally, physically, and emotionally. That's usually what the majority of us past 58 experience, unless I live in a bubble. Have you seen the same? <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's what's kind of fun about this group or this demographic or this area. It's like I, I get at least people that kind of get it by virtue of the fact that you've all grown up a little bit. You've all grown old, <laughs> but just because you grow old doesn't mean you're gonna grow up. That's something to consider too. And so what I'd like to talk about and get a little heavy with is the concept of consciousness. So we're gonna kind of create a little framework. We're gonna to have to agree. I only have an, how long is this? There, there you go. There's my prep work. You know, I was, I have little kids and I just run out of the house and do what I gotta do and get the peanut butter off my pants. But uh, it's just true. Uh, so, okay, so we have to agree on some terms. 
Yeah. And so that's what we're going to do. So let's look at like kind of a platform here. We have to agree on the concept that there's a thing called form. <laughs> there's a thing called energy, right? Running through the light bulb. And there's this thing called consciousness, which is aware of the form and the energy. Does that kind of make sense? They call that Jing Chi and Shang. Yeah, I'll write it down. Jing Chi Shang. Yeah. So form, energy, and consciousness. Some traditions call it the Trinity. You know, so however you want to do it, sir, go back there and sit down. Next will be on the stage. Yeah. Just, okay. So Jing Chi and Chan. We have to kind of because this is all comes into play here. All right. So form, energy, and consciousness. Pretty simple, right? And an example is the, the light bulb itself. So you can say the light bulb, the bulb is the form, right? Yeah. And then the electric goes through it, that's the energy, and the light is the shun, the consciousness. Yeah, so it plays out everywhere, constantly over and over again. Okay. So what we have to look at is, unfortunately, we predominantly, especially in the West, live in a form-based world, a material world, a you know, worldly success, earthly values. Yeah. So we spend the majority of our life, especially in this culture, basically dominated by form. Does that kind of make sense? And when I say form, I'm talking about your body. Firstly, I'm a man, you know, and I identify as a man, and it's important to do so. And then I've got to get a job, and then I've got to pay bills, and oh, I should get a car so the girls like me. And then all, right? It's all form. It's all ego. You start combing your hair. Hey, how you doing? Right? It's all the development of ego. That's all form. And that's all necessary, but it's very egoic. Here's the problem with form. It's impermanent. So form, as soon as you're done building your new house, all right? You got your new house built. You move in. Wow, the new house. The first thing that new house starts doing is what? Falling apart. Falling apart. <laughs> Especially if you buy a boat. Buy a boat. You really want to see that lesson. So the, the, it, uh, everything, as soon as it's done evolving in its expression of form, the first, it's just like this. It's either going up or going down. In this plane, in this dimension, nothing just hangs out. So we are dominated by form as a culture and pretty much a species, form. It's all form. Now, we're kind of aware of energy. You can feel heat you know, on your body, and you can feel it coming out of a fire, and you know, the sun, that's kind of energy. Consciousness, we just jumped out of the uh, delusion of I think, therefore I am. That's a, a fallacy, because who's thinking? You know, I am, therefore I think. Someone's aware of thought. So what we need to, the real journey here is realizing first these three steps. This is a part of growing up. If we stay in here, all you can ever hope to do is grow old. And so this culture, though, celebrates youth. You know, so if I'm not up here in a thong, you know, I'm not that sexy, and I'm never going to get the views. And you're not, it's not going to sell. Because that's what we need, sexy. Because sexy celebrates youth and form. And we identify who we are with our form. So first we identify, yes, I'm Mike, and I have the stuff. I've got the hairy arms. and the Okay, I'm a guy. Yeah, and then my car, then my job, and then my career. My stuff is who I am. It becomes a pro almost like a thing, a, a projection of you. But it's not you. But we fight and die and live as if it is. Even your thought forms, by virtue of the, the title, thought form, they're not you either. You're not your thoughts. You're not even your emotions. You're that which is aware of it. Okay, so here's the fatal concept. That is all lead. That's all turbid. It's primarily unconscious. It's very, very, what they call a kong su or a, a, an animal in a human body. And most of us live and die in that state. So we come in as a child pretty much unconscious. We identify with our language and our culture 
and then we identify with our stuff and our status, and then we pretty much rot and die. I mean, right? I know that's. I had a bunch of wonderful sayings. I've got a bunch of greeting, I got greeting cards out there with all of this in that you can share it with friends. And so, so this is the piece, the lead that I'm talking about. And we want to be the gold in the golden years. So we have to think a little bit about this. So we need to know what the heck is not gold. They asked Buddha, "What is enlightenment?" And what did he say? He said, "What it wasn't." Enlightenment isn't suffering. That's it. So we're going to say, what is gold? Well, I'm going to tell you what gold isn't. And that's, it's not, it's not lead. It's not heavy, turbid, suffering, unconscious, addicted to form, thought form, emotions, and events, story. That's all not you. The gold is that which is aware of it. It's fine. They call that the tricky gate. Really coming to grips with, actually, I am the observer. It's always been me. It's always been now. So you sit here. I stand here in front of you thinking I'm still some sexy 20-year-old guy. Right? You look in the mirror and you're like, what the hell happened? Because your consciousness doesn't change. Just your form does. Just the stuff around you does. But the consciousness is the constant, and the consciousness is the gold. And so if you can walk out of here... Just with that piece of information, the very quality of your reality will change. It's what they call a mind seal moment when the definition of reality is forever altered. Now, we get those mind seal moments for free by virtue of trauma. So bad stuff happens and who we are and how we look at the world changes forever. Yeah, and that's free. That usually just comes right to you. Good stuff. Yeah, you'll notice that. You don't even have to leave the house sometimes. The doorbell ring. You know, I've got a warrant. You know, and so, right? so I always keep the windows closed. But so, but it's true, right? So you have to earn the gold. You got to go get those moments that kind of elevate. Remember, we all grow old. Very few of us grow up, and just because you grow old. Doesn't mean you've grown up. Okay? And this creates a real problem. Because if you didn't grow up, but you didn't grow old, you're still powerful, young, and sexy. Think about it. So we're like, okay, well, I can deal with it. Powerful, young, and sexy. They didn't really grow up. A bit of an idiot, but I'm going. <laughs> right? Because that's good. But what happens when you're old and you didn't grow up? Now, you got a problem. And so it becomes more and more, and then the polarity gets greater and greater. Because the world in which we live in, which is addicted to form, wants that, not someone who's grown old and didn't grow up. So then you become isolated, and your sense of value changes, which is lead, which is a crime, which is a sin, and a fallacy. So we need to, to kind of maybe take a peek at this here. So here's my magic chart. <coughs> And here's a theory. So from zero to eight was the spring of your life. That's when you formed your ego. Mine, me, you know, this stuff. You speak. Your, the ego is formed by eight, according to this tradition. Springtime of your life, energy, pardon me, is going, you know, out. Then in the summer, 33 to 58, the energy is going up. That's just flowering. So if you look at this, they use all of this stuff really goes from Analogies of nature, you know, just look at plants and you'll see it. They sprout out, then they flower. And the funny thing is, you don't really know what's going on here until that plant flowers. You ever know you got a garden? Once it flowers, you know, oh yeah, that's not spinach, <laughs> right? You can tell because it, it's so. That's that's what happens. So it's a very so with the little human being, it's like okay, cool. But the flowering, look at me. This is what I'm going to be. I'm so sexy. Come pollinate me. That's the flower. So from 33 to 58 is all about your potential. You know, you go to school, you do all the stuff. By the time you hit 58, that's earth. Late summer, the fruity and fruition. Okay, very important piece because what happens between 8 and 58 is, yes, the total pursuit of jing or the mundane. Your whole reality is about stuff. 
First your education, then your relationship, then you know well, your, your car, your thing, your house, then the kids, then their education, stuff, more stuff and stuff, retirement portfolios and another car, it's stuff, right? It's what it is, it's all stuff. And guess what, it's important because we need to have the gear to play the game. So that's cool. But what happens is the amount of damage that happens from zero to 58, if it's extreme, in other words, more than 51%, negative, kills you by 58. Because we all know people that have dropped dead before 58. And if you look at it, they're either hit by a chicken truck or, you know what I mean, they had some type of extreme health condition. You know, and a lot of times these extreme health conditions are actually the final manifestation of internal emotional torment. Because we just dumped uh, death hormones for 30 years at the office trying to close that loan. You, you see, as you rot in your chair for eight hours a day. It's true. And so this is what we do. And so what you do is you go through this, this phase of life where it's the pursuit of Jing at the cost of your chi and the disturbance of your shun, which ultimately rots the jing. It's true, I deal with this all the time. I do diagnoses and intake all the time. I hear more stories make you cry, some of the stuff I read on the our in intake. What people have gone through, it's insane. But it's pretty much hell, because you don't have to go to hell to get there. You're gonna bring hell with you. <laughs> yeah. It's just another greeting card. And, and so I had a, I come up with a line of them, and I'll be all happy with it. You know, a little sweater on, looking pleasant. And you don't have to go to heaven to get to heaven. You'll bring heaven with you. So this is the time to manifest the realm. So from here to here, insane damage. And then there's even cultural damage. We've got the 80s. Remember the 80s with the members only and the, all the cocaine and the partying? That whole generation blew off their kidneys and their adrenals. Mm -hmm. And you talk about heart attack and stroke, and it's really they blew themselves out. Then you add close, 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 buy, 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 <laughs> and you live years and years in this uh, allostatic load of cortisol. We're not really designed for that. We're designed to dump those chemicals when we're being chased by a tiger and then pretty much chill in the garden. But well, we've created a life where you're always being chased by a tiger. It's very sad, but true. So then we get into this space where we start to uh, die from the inside out. And by the time we're 58, well, no, we're not 58. We're 70. Because the average American is at least seven years older biologically than they are chronologically. So 10 years you can easily put on there. 12, very common, but at least seven. So this is all the chase of the stuff, which is the gear. It's just the gear you need to play life. Has anybody known the person that buys all the gear but never plays the sport? We know that guy, right? He's got seven guitars but can't do an F bar chord. It's like, dude, you got all these, and they spent money on it because they kind of give you the false sense of doing it. I'm doing it, man. No, you have gas. <laughs> and that's a term we use for gear acquisition syndrome. And that's true. Musicians do it all the time. They get all the amps, all the stuff. They can't. They can't drive past a music store without buying something. And so it's because it helps you engage, you know. And then the people do it in the, the yoga community. The a lot of these communities, they go to every workshop. They get every uh, map, but they go nowhere. They read every book, but they apply nothing. But during the moment in which you're doing it, you feel like, okay, I'm getting this done. It kind of creates a sense of internal peace. It's true. That's what we do, right? So very common. So we have Jing, Chi, and Chun. This is the first step. is the acquisition of the gear. That's all form. It's all impermanent, and you take none of it with you. There's never a moving truck behind a hearse, right? <laughs> You've heard that before. And so you take none of it with you. So it's designed, though, to support you in your journey. So... This is a very, very key piece in our life. Zero to 58, most of us fail. From zero to 58, our first real responsibility is, sure, you've got to understand the mundane. You need to know the language. You need to know how to act, you know, like communicate. Confucian, be the good citizen. You know, number one citizen, good citizen. You know, I have what they call dignity. Right now, I'm changing diapers. Uh, you know, I've got one little guy that 
just it's just like, dude, you can't do this when you're 20. We're gonna need to break this. <laughs> and so, right, you all did it for your children, and it was all done for you. And then it's very difficult to get someone just to be a dignified human being. Think about it. Your word is your honor, your actions are your way, all the stuff. And on time, take a shower, you know, eat with your mouth closed, all of this stuff. <laughs> You know, and guess what? A lot of us don't even get that far. So now you're you're in a human body, but you're basically an animal. And what do we do with them? We put them in cages. And the weaker the society, the more cages. Because they're not even going through the first level of form. How to basically take care of your own basic stuff. Then it becomes the whole meaning of your life. Oops. You don't play the game, but your whole life and all your money and all your time is spent on buying the equipment. What is the game? So that's the, you know, the key piece here. So we have to look at this phase. First phase we go through in our personal evolution inside of growing up is the reflection. To honestly see this, to see the nature of reality. But that reflection doesn't happen if, in fact, what you're looking at is turbid. Example. The old days they didn't have mirrors, so the only way you'd see an honest reflection of your face is to look in the calm water. But the water is always being slapped by thought. So you never really truly see your own nature. So they call that tranquility. Where there's tranquility, there's clarity. Where there's clarity, there's the constant. So an example, and this I know this is gonna be, and I spent decades traveling around the planet, learning from masters and being abused to learn this stuff. And I'm going to try to give it to you in an hour. So if it's kind of crazy and moving fast, cool, it's recorded. But these are complex, you know, uh, ideas. But let's maybe use an analogy of that's a glass, that's water, and that's a diamond. The glass is your body, the water are your thoughts, and the diamond is your consciousness. The diamond is that which will not change. It's been here before you, it will be here after you, but you're cut off from it right now. Why? You can't see the diamond because the thought form, sprinkle a little dirt in there, you know, this happened today, that happened tomorrow, a little dirt, and you're mixing it. You're mixing it, calling Jenny. Can you believe Frank called me and said he wasn't gonna go? We mix, we mix, we mix, you never see the diamond. All you see is the turbid. No, 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 take your hand out of there, the mixer out of there, stop, become tranquil. So this is going to stop moving, and the dirt's going to stop to the bottom, and all you're going to be left with is that diamond. The diamond is what you are. That diamond is better, you know, that's also you could say the gold. I could set a chunk of gold if you'd like. It's an analogy. So what we're trying to do is the first level is realize that this is all cool, but this is all about constant movement of impermanence, the emotions, the story, and the stuff. And it really creates turbidity, which cuts you off from your nature. The only time <coughs> you see your nature, there's three times free. My teacher taught me this when I was a kid. Three times in your life, you'll get an opportunity to see the nature of your mind. And that's during trauma. When you drop to your knees and ask God why. And so a lot of times we even associate that moment. We don't even want to go there. We just got to keep tapping our foot and calling someone and tapping our nails. You ever see people? God forbid I'm left in my own mind. I have a, an ashram up in the mountains. Some of you have been there. And it's up there behind the lake. All you hear are eagles and ravens and creatures. And it's you, man. There is no 7-Eleven. There is not nothing. And I've lived up there four years, you know, by myself. Me and my brothers and stuff. But they have my little place. And it's just me and God, my flute and my stuff and I, I like it it's the worst place in the world for an addict <laughs> why can't get anything can't get your lotto cards can't get your coffee you can't get your beer you can't get your women you can't get your gambling you can't <laughs> and i'll bring people up there i say hey, come on it's you and me i got some medicine for you oh really you're gonna train me yeah it's this it's called nothing the worst thing you can do is put someone in that space it's so hard for but it's the best medicine because it takes them out of the stimulation that's, that's constantly mixing this. We have an aversion to that tranquility because there's so much fear. And we associate, you know, our story with our life. That's why you argue. That's why you'll get so pissed if someone challenges your belief. 
Who here is a Democrat? Come on, raise your hand. I won't hit you with a stick. Who here is a Republican? Okay, you're both nuts. Okay, how about that? Because it's all bullshit. You know what I mean? But you have to have an identity, and that's great. But people will fight and die. They will fight and die for that, red or blue. That's the epitome of insanity. Because they associate who they are with their political belief. That's not who you are. That's what you believe. That's cool, and it might work. So when you get so wrapped up in I'm right, you are completely unconscious. And you're actually fighting for your life. It's called ego death. No bullshit. This can't be. It's a, someone may as well have a gun to your head. You'll fight that hard. Have you ever seen it? It's like, no one's going to get killed here. Take it easy. But ego death is creepy, and it's really, really like everywhere. Your thought forms really restrict you because you think you're your, stuff, your, your thoughts. You're not. How about your, your gender? We're doing the whole, you know, women's shit. Okay, how about your race? You know, I'm Italian. My name is Michael Leone. Surprise, right? <laughs> so I don't care about all of the, I like the stereotypes. They add spice. I don't associate my true consciousness with my hairy Italian meat suit. You know what I mean? It's just what I'm wearing in this game. I don't care. When I would go and I live, uh, I have that, I have this. I live in Hawaii in the summer for many years, three months out of the year. And I have stuff because I've owned a lot of these centers. I've done pretty good in the world of form. When I live in Hawaii, I drive the most blown out, rusty, stinky Avalon. The door doesn't close. It smells like salt water and fish. And I call it the ego crusher. <laughs> it's good to drive around in a car with no leaf springs and just be a total, you know, egoless because I'm not my car. You know, I don't care. I know I've got a Mercedes at home. You, you see what I'm saying? But I don't need my Mercedes to be the guy. I got my ego crusher, the Avalon. And it's horrible. If you've seen it, it you smell it before I got to you. The oil, everything. But so if you don't associate yourself with your thought forms and your stuff, you have more space. And you can't die like that. People go through a lot of unnecessary ego death and they find themselves fighting for their life because of thought form and form and stuff. So this is a tough one. That all has to be reconciled. Now, reflection is the first step. Because once you stop and reflect, you'll realize every single one of us has inner conflict. And that's the inner fight. That's the next level in your you know, theory and your journey, is to realize, oh, I'm a human being and I'm fundamentally flawed. And that's okay. Because it's that fundamental flaw that allows you to exist. You think about that. Okay, how many blades of grass has there been on this planet since day one? Right? How many of them were the same? Not one. The only thing that allows infinite divisibility is imperfection. So if the universe is going to keep churning out miserable little human beings, what makes them unique is their imperfection. You have the perfect template, and all the variance comes from the slight imperfections. It's the very imperfection that allows existence. So why would you, you know, get all hung up on that? Just to see that and see the big part of the imperfection, here's how to get really heavy on you now. Okay. Your unconscious form. You're in form, but you don't even realize your consciousness. The journey is to become conscious form. Does that make any sense? So we go from basically formless consciousness now, I'm a Roman Catholic, so I go with the whole heaven, clouds, you know, cool guys with armor, that kind of thing. And then I was a little cherub with puffy wings, yeah. And then I came here. But that was formless consciousness, just pure consciousness. But as soon as you show up, the price you pay for being here is unconscious form. You forget your everything. The journey in growing up is to become conscious form before death. Because at that point, there is no death. In Taoism, they talk about, have you ever heard of Taoist immortals? Now, I, I'm really losing here, aren't I? But that's okay. They talk about becoming an immortal. That's the big goal in inner alchemy. And, so, and they talk about turning lead to gold. So there's actually people that try to turn lead to gold and try to become immortal. 
which is not true. Those are just analogies. Those are stories designed to organize the teachings. Turning lead to gold is going from someone who's just based on lower thinking to someone who's based on higher thinking. That's all it is, turning lead to gold. Becoming immortal is someone who thinks basically, they're basically unconscious form. The moment you realize that you are conscious form, then you also realize you're a conscious energy. At that moment, they say an immortal is born. So it's not like your body is going to be around for gajillions. That's not what they're thinking. It's really about the evolution of breaking away from being completely dominated by Jing form and to slowly start to realize, hey, there's that inner conflict. And now I can start to balance that inner conflict. And now the light can turn on. And I can see the nature of reality. The primary goal is to get your equipment, get your education, procreate, have your stuff, and then get busy. Doing what? Okay? I've got another analogy for you. I'm filled with it. Okay? Are, are you following me so far? Does this resonate? Okay? You can always scream bullshit in the background if you don't believe me. I'm good. I love a debate. So, okay. So, here is an egg. Right? There are many like it, but this egg is you. Okay? That's the egg. And this is the nest. Yeah? So, the nest. Getting the stuff for the egg. You're the egg. But the problem is you spend all your time gathering the stuff for the egg, but you never sit on the egg. So when your time is over, the egg cracks for one reason or another, and all you have is rotting yolk going downward. But if you're smart enough to get your stuff, make your nest, then once you got your stuff, you're not driving around in a golf cart, golfing all day, people, you sit on the damn egg. That's from 58 to 100 days. Your primary responsibility is to cultivate. When you sit on that egg and it cracks, a bird comes up. That bird is conscious energy. That's it. Or you're conscious enough to get into whatever heaven or realm you believe in. Whatever you believe in, if you die, they say, with inner conflict and fear and loneliness and all this crap, there's so much turbidity that whatever your God is, it can be Elvis. You're not going to get there. So it's about really understanding with true sincerity and tranquility the nature of reality. And that is, it's always been you, it's always been now. You come in as unconscious form. Hopefully you sit on the egg and become conscious form. Upon death, you're conscious energy. They even do work where even though you're in form, you can work on being conscious energy and doing really cool cities, they call it. You can see stuff and have a little bit of, you know, cultivate some intuition. Kind of get a feel. As long as you're in form, you're never going to nail it, but you can get a sense of it. Every wisdom tradition has ceremonies and things that they do to kind of get a sense of that. That's what you stalk. You get all this stuff, give you the resources and the time, the energy, and the education to pursue this sitting on the egg. No, we don't. We just keep getting stuff as the egg rots. Is, is that kind of clear? Mm -hmm. So the whole objective inside of this first phase, get the stuff. Next phase, once you really get that light to turn on, now you start to become what they call a mountain. Now you start to become empowered. See, right now, our, 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 the reason we run into a lot of trouble is we've separated the... elders from the children. It's really what we did. We first started with the father. If you can nail the father, you nail the grandparents. You got it. So once you get that father gone, this child will be even lucky to deal with the mundane. Lucky. They've done stats on it. Very hard. Okay? So then, if you do that, you guarantee the absence of the elders. And so when the elders are there, they foster this. You notice how it connects from 108 to 8. It connects again. And what happens is that's the gold in your culture. The gold in your culture is the wisdom of the elders that grew up as they grew old. And that saves them 
this. They can quickly jump to make a nest. They've got the resources and they've got the know-how and they've got the wisdom tradition. But more importantly, they've got the example of somebody over 58 standing in their power. When I was a boy, I was lucky enough to train with my grandmasters and masters, and they were all 58 up to 100. And, and when I started this as a kid, I just wanted to fight. I was just a, you know, a boxing guy, golden gloves kid, you know, in the old neighborhood. And it was like, wow, I like this. And holy crap, this guy can kick. Whoa, what's that? And so I started my wacky little journey. But really, what was I fighting? Myself. I was fighting my lack of confidence. I was fighting my inner conflict. I was fighting, trying to defend myself against myself. There was a part of me that knew better, but the demon was stronger. That's all it was. And I found working out, training, and being disciplined helped me deal with the demon. It gave me the strength and discipline to overcome that po, that jing, that lower part. Then I was just good karma. Finally found a Dong Han Daoist grandmaster who was, as far as I was concerned, old as Methuselah. You know, and he was the baddest guy I've ever met. He was an old dude. So my definition of, huh, okay, so youth and strength isn't necessarily power because this guy can clean the room out. You know, and I've tried. I tried to round kick him in the head as he was walking out. Was, you know, why not? I'm a good fighter. I got to kick this guy. You know, just see if he's good. I was very cocky. I know that's hard to believe. And, <laughs> and just turn around, get him, block the thing, hit me. I knocked out. I laid on the floor, and he was in the office reading the paper when I woke up. I wasn't even concerned. And then if you bump into him, you fall over. It's like, what the hell? He's like a pillar. How is this? And there's more. You know, and the women. You should see the, the elder women and the Taoist traditions. You know, these people that train and Tai Chi and Bagua and all these systems. And it's like, whoa, their eyes are just lit up and there's so much juice there. And wow, they got all this experience. Can't find them. You're not going to find them at Fry's. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? But I knew they existed and that's all I needed. It's like, aha. Because all I saw, my dad was a Chicago cop. So were my uncles. <laughs> so was everyone in some way or another, a cop or a fireman, you know. And they died for a long time. And they didn't live well. And everywhere I looked, it kind of sucked. And so this is life. I get in El Dorado, smoke a cigar, and drop that at 58. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, okay. And so then I, it didn't sit well with me. So I started seeing what few people see is the elders in their power. What that would do to the collective, let's say culture, is amazing. Because now you can start to see, aha, this person grew up. So they have this whole piece, but they're the mountain, meaning they're very stable. And more importantly, they have what they call the, see a mountain, there's wind and mountain in this tradition. There's gansa, right? And there's a uh, yin gun. So gansa is basically wind. It's just bullshit. It's just blah, 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 stuff, 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 stuff. Constantly changing, constantly a story. Another news story hits. Another, someone's getting molested in Hollywood. This corrupt politician's corrupt. Everywhere you look, it's just insanity. And if you talk to this one person, they're like, yeah, you know, Frank, you know, we're all there and there's Frank. You know, Frank's pretty cool. Yeah, Frank, sure. And then Frank leaves. Listen, the guy owes me money. We can't go for it. Shit. It's like, wait a minute. Right? You see it a lot. It's kind of disturbing. Once you know yourself, you become a consistent version of yourself. Why? The younger generation is always watching. Always. They pick up stuff you never even think of. They're always watching. So one variation in your nature imprints them. This be the mountain. Next step, changing your reality. Reality is very scary. They think that this counts. And if you tell someone, listen, man, it's not all about money and stuff, they won't believe you. They won't believe you. Because usually the guy that says it's not about money and stuff is a spiritual vagrant living in Hawaii with dreadlocks on the beach. Right? It's really, man, it's just about like now. But you can't pay your bills. You didn't earn the right to say that. You can't say it's not about stuff. And you've got all the stuff. And then you realize it's not about stuff. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just a kind of like a poser. You're using that, no, I'm, see, I'm spiritual. And that's an excuse to live on your mother's couch until you're 30. <laughs> so that's very dangerous. 
So they're like, wait a minute, no, wait, you've done this. You got all the stuff. You're not too moved by it. And you keep telling me the stuff doesn't count. The only way I'm going to listen to someone who tells me the stuff doesn't count is if they have the stuff. You have the stuff. And you have the experience. So now all of a sudden, this little impressionable mind, which is our future, it starts to see that elder has the mountain, very consistent. As far as they're concerned, you've been alive forever. So even the proportion of your consistency is, is, is blown out of proportion. But that's okay. And they can see you can change your reality by manifesting. You can actually make something happen with your belief structure. You've all done all that stuff. You're here now. There's very valuable. Then finally you have the seats. What are you going to give them? See, because from here, 58 to 83 is gold. This is where we are now, the metal period. What do we mean by this? So I'm going to take a little turn here. I'll get back. So in traditional Chinese medicine, all of these elements and seasons, like right now, even now, we're in the fall. They use kind of like three different clocks. Technically, there's more. But the first clock is a 24-hour clock. And if you look at this clock, you'll see it shows you right now what's going on. We're in, you know, fire. Energy runs through the body in a 24-hour cycle, sticking basically in different organs for a couple of hours and allowing them to do the maintenance, cellular repair, and everything that they need. Western science has proven this. That's called the Hare cycle. That's why when you travel or you get a little bit older, it's hard to sleep or hard to evacuate your bowels and all of these, you know, things that are part of the nervous system uh, start to go off like your timing belt slips. But that's the first clock we watch, that clock. The next clock is the year clock. It's like, well, it's the fall. Get your flu shot if you're a fool. And then go ahead and, you know, uh, get ready because there's going to be uh, pathogenic wind and cold entering the lungs and large intestines. That's just what it is. It's traditional Chinese medicine would show you some breathing exercises and needle some points. You'd be fine. But that belongs to metal. It's the fall. Then there's your life. Same setup. Like gears. 24-hour gear, 12-month gear, 108-year gear. Does that make any sense? So by understanding, you know, the, the, the cycle that we go through, we have to realize that from 58 to 83 is metal. Even physiologically, the things that belong to metal in traditional Chinese medicine, like the lungs, the large intestine, the skin, the body here, change at this age. The collagen in your skin starts to go. The breath, especially if you don't do the work, you start to get that, you know, that you can even hear the voice, right? You listen to talk radio. Hi, this is Betty from Sun City. It's like, whoa, what is she in an oxygen tank? And it's like you can tell the lungs are gone. You, you, you see it? And so it starts to show up. So it's formulaic, and we're all having the same kind of experience. So we have to know that this period, you basically got two choices. Everything that happened between here and here will start to kill you because you can't let it go. Now your resistance of the summer is gone. You're young enough to deal with eating pizza at 3 in the morning, drinking two cases of beer and fighting it forward, and you can pull it off. But don't try it at 58, it'll kill you. <laughs> but we sometimes don't change our behavior. We, we deal with our mind, our relationships, our energy, our schedule, our diet, our exercise, like we're 47. And what was medicine? Guess what? It's poison now. It's like, sure, you can wear a bathing suit in July, but it'll kill you in February in New England. <laughs> do, do, do you see it? So it's like we know it, but we don't do it. So this period, fall also belongs to cutting away the harvest. Everything that isn't truly you, everything that doesn't serve you, and everything that does not express your highest humanness, inga, humanness, has to go. Or you'll start paying for it quickly. Karma comes so much quicker after 58. I'm, I'm serious. You can get away with all kinds of nonsense here, and it'll take years to catch up to you. Here, immediately. <laughs> Because your almost karmic resistance and your way she feels, your immune system, just can't cope with it anymore. So if you don't start cutting away the dark, the lead, then guess what? That's how you're going to die. Whatever your addictions are, whether it's an addiction to form or your emotions, uh, however you roll, guess what? That's it. That's what's going to take you out. So the first step is start to cut away all that is not you and does not serve you. That's the alchemy. That's when they mean by alchemy is, you know, you take this base metal 
and you put it in a cauldron, you bring up heat and pressure, and you change its molecular structure, right? So the cultivation in this, what we do is we do seated meditation to create that clarity. We do standing to make sure all of the meridians and everything are properly, you know, uh, so every, uh, energy is flowing unimpeded, and we move right and left, upper and lower, simultaneously in opposite directions. That's <laughs> our pill. That is actually the ingredient for the elixir. Seated meditation, standing practices, and moving practices is what they call the immortal's elixir. And that all of that piece becomes, you can get away with it sporadically in here, you can't hear Chemically, after about 58, <clears throat> see, when you, you know, you dump so many chemicals every day. Some are remodeling chemicals that reorganize and remodel cells of the body. And some are demolition chemicals that are designed to break down the body. And when we're young, it's like a 60-40. Because you got to still break down waste. You know, it goes in the lymph system and it's removed. Sure. But there's still more remodelers on the work site than demo guys. Well, guess what? There's more demo guys than remodelers. However, you can trigger the chemical release of these remodeling hormones through seated meditation, standing, and moving practices. It's almost strategic trauma. So if I stand like this, and I can stand like this for so long. Those of you that have been here wish I stand up after a while because you're doing it with me. And so what's really happening, after a while, all right, my thighs are flexing, my glutes are flexing, my calves are flexing. This is cool. And after a while, what's going to happen is it's going to start to shake and burn a long while. For you, you'd be shaking now. <laughs> okay? But really what's happening is, hmm, my femur is slightly bending because of the actual tug. Oh, interesting. Uh-oh, I'm starting to break down the muscle belly. Oh, uh-oh. All of this is strategic. So that when I get up and I sleep, I trigger the release of remodeling hormones. Okay, tennis elbow. How do they do it? With an incision, they scrape the tendon. With the scalpel, they, that's it. And they sew you up. What the hell? It's strategic trauma designed to trigger the remodeling chemicals. That's all it is. So when you work out, like if I work out, my whole body feels it. If I want to make my lower body flexible, I can just do a bunch of shoulder exercises and my lower body is flexible because the chemicals cascade over the whole body. That's a key. So now you've got to manually turn up the thermostat yourself. Up until 58, it does it automatically. After that, you've got to do it. Or there's more demolition than remodeling. Your body is designed to stay biologically about 48 until death. Isn't that amazing as far as function and stuff? I mean, you might not look good in a bikini, but it works. Okay? And so, but because otherwise we would be eaten by a creature. You know, there is no, I'm going to gather with this little cart. <clears throat> you get into the silly little cart and, and fries. You're not looking for food. You are food. <laughs> and that's how God does it. And so it's like we, we, we've come so far off the ranch. So the, the goal here is during this period is you can shift this, this, this experience so that you actually are in your power. You're not even respected until 58 in, 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 you know, in our world because you're still a kid. You haven't grown up. You know, according to the traditional tradition, it takes at least 58 to 60 years for a human being to grow up. The problem is we die before we grow up. So we die children. I'm serious. And so very seldom does someone get to the point where they, they nail the goal down. And they have not only for themselves, but the seeds for their next generation. Because what are you going to leave? My teacher would always say rotten fruit. You have two choices, rotten fruit or seeds. What? Okay, you have stuff, you have a portfolio. So think in your mind right now about the people that have changed your life, right, in a positive way. And you're not picturing their car, their house, their clothes, or their stuff. You're picturing or remembering the moment they imparted a certain amount of wisdom that helped you remove suffering. The end of the day.
that person was there for you, whether they meant it or not. You're going to be one of two things, an example or a warning. That's it. So your eulogy, what you leave is your seeds, not the rotten fruit. Because all the stuff that you leave, your house, the portfolio with the thing, and the, so what? It's impermanent. It's going to rot too. It's just worldly crap. But if you can leave the seeds of wisdom and save that person suffering and help them accelerate, knowing, okay, build the nest, but then go ahead and sit on that egg. It's not just the stuff. It's the consciousness that counts. You know, we have uh, stuff. And we give away man-made truth and knowledge, education. Well, I'll give them an education. That's a good thing, but even education is a principle. What do I mean by that? There's a hunger. We all have a hunger. Every one of us. And there's, like they say it in the Native American, there's the two wolves that live inside you, the black wolf and the light wolf. The black wolf is addicted to pain, suffering, and evil. The light wolf is addicted to, of course, joy, grace, and devolution. Which one wins? The one you feed. That's it. And so your job is to be that white wolf, but then also let people see the white wolf exists and then show them how to become it themselves. That's leading by principle. See, because a principle never changes. It's been that way forever. Universal principle is outside of man-made time. Okay. Man-made time is thought from law, for example. Completely impermanent, constantly changing. I can be a lawyer here, but in Canada, I'm not a lawyer. Man-made truth, completely impermanent based on popular need for the moment. But it does not endure. I can be a doctor, but go to Mexico, I can't operate. Man-made truth, constantly changing, completely unstable. The universal truth, the root power, is that which will never change. And that's intuitively what we all have a hunger for. We don't know. We don't know that. So we go around gathering more gene, trying to fill a hunger that will never be filled. Because the real hunger begins with self-knowledge. And understanding the root principles that never change. You are not the leaves. You're not the flowers. You're not the fruit. You're the trunk. You're the roots. That which does not sway in the wind. And so to know it and share that, to know it, be it, and share it, is the greatest gift you can give to the next generation. Whether it's your own flesh and blood or whether it's just people in general. Giving them an example that you don't have to be completely a liability to the state and to your family and to others after 58. Because I got to tell you, we've got a problem. We have a massive problem as a culture with the people coming in and basically after 58 becoming a big liability. And that's why they're passing the law. Well, we're going to look at you and not a hip replacement. How about a pill? I'm going to give you a pill. Go home, take it. We'll call the coroner in the morning. <laughs> and that's what they're doing because you're not worth the investment because you're not going to pay more taxes you're just a liability they were hoping you were going to be dead three years after retirement the whole system's based on you being dead damn it but you're not you're right here did you, did you see it and that's kind of where society is now when you look at your elders like that which should really be the golden brain trust of what is imperative for the evolution the seeds for the new sprout that way you're done so we're ultimately looking at the collective evolution of humanity, the lifting consciousness, removing suffering. And just by being in your power, you are the example. That is the biggest gift you can give. That's, I mean, I teach here, I teach senior citizens, but I teach all different levels of groups. But I found the senior citizens are the hardest to teach physically. You know, have you ever seen the movie Young Frankenstein? <laughs> when he was trying to teach him putting on the ritz, bump, 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 bump. It's Frankenstein, he can't dance. And that's my daily life. <laughs> and so, but that's okay. Because I'm not really looking for uh, uh, pro athletes. I train them already. But these people, I don't have to teach them about self-respect. I don't have to teach them about discipline. I don't have to teach them about courtesy. I don't have to teach them about showing up. They have it all. So, you know, my, my other clients, the young ones, 18 to 30, I got to teach them. No, listen, listen, don't speak in the middle of the lesson and show some respect and don't really, you're not going to make it because your girlfriend's mad. And like, you got to show up to, and you know, it's like you spend a lot of time dealing with the, the childish, you know, decency piece you have it. If you're here, you have it. 
but it's this piece. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, okay, it's a different challenge, but I think I get a better result. I'd rather <laughs> teach a 70 year old than a 27 year old any day. And so that's, you know, just my, my personal experience. So when we look at being the gold in the golden years, ultimately we're looking at cultivation and really starting to upgrade. Well, Jane Chi Shun, am I really formed? Look at your form, guys. How's it going? You know what I mean? Is that what you want to really uh, hold, you know what I mean, your, your value to? Is that really? It's very depressing. <laughs> and so, and so what you got, and the energy does start to wane. But as this falls, this should get brighter. Okay, so I've had people work with me here, quit, because they didn't want to be around old people. They found it depressing. They'd rather teach yoga in Scottsdale where the Lululemons are <laughs> tight. You know, it's good stuff. It's like, okay, but okay, all right, I'm gonna, I, I can do. But what happens when you're that person? So if you can't be around that, and that makes you uncomfortable, what are you going to do to you when you're that? <laughs> right? You can't leave or you jump off a building. And so there's a there, – but our culture celebrates the flesh, celebrates the youth, celebrates the power, and when – celebrates the stuff. And, and that's also why it's very hungry because they never really got the root. But I'll tell you this. My clients here – you know, because I was kind of shocked because I kind of forget. To be honest with you, I don't see old people. I don't see that at all. I don't even know their names. If you'll notice, I don't really remember your name. I don't. <laughs> uh, I just don't. But what I do see is your energy. It's all energy balls to me. I don't know. Even gender is almost a detail. But the energy, as this becomes kind of not so much, this does get stronger. So that the energy, like there's almost a, okay, a returning that happens. You can make it past this. And this is what I mean. If you see my baby, okay, when he's not climbing on the walls and throwing the camera at you, and you look at his gigantic eyes, hazel eyes, it's just God. There's innocence there. There's no corruption. There's none. Of it. It's just a, a little angel, you know? And so, and then this starts. Corruption begins. Mind me, ha ha ha. Screw you, I'm lying. Uh, you know, we know it all. You've been there, right? So then that's kind of a, they go away. They go away. This is the furthest away from source. But you'll notice if you still hang out and you check these people out, they start getting more innocent again. And there's like a return. All Taoism is about returning. And so for me, there's a joy. There's an innocence, there's a sincerity, there's a who gives a shit what color my socks are, you know what I mean? There's there's that. That's awesome. You, you see, so there's power there. And so so it depends, what are you looking at? You know, what are the values? So if you're the gold during the golden years, it's good for you, but it's really good for this group. Very, very good. Because now you give them something to model that's beyond the nest. And it takes the pressure off of this. Who really gives a crap? You know, I got a buddy uh, that owns, you know, Core Institute. Maybe. He's a friend of mine. He owns it. He's the guy. And I train him. He's an apprentice. And, you know, he's a great guy. And well, I gave him years ago because he's always growing. And he's, he's always like a guy cat in a cage. You know, he's, his mind just can't stop moving. So the book I gave him was called Enough. Read that. You just need enough, just enough to live comfortably, to have no worries. You don't have to sneak up on the mailbox. You can just be here, have enough, but you don't have to own all of Europe. I mean, you know, that type of human being that needs to take over the world is so hungry and has such an absence of the true understanding of their own nature. Do you ever see the yogis, they say namaste? You know what namaste means? God within. God within. Acknowledge the God within me acknowledges the God within you. Yes. Ah, very important. Yes. It's interesting how China wants to take over. China? Oh, that's a whole other story. But isn't it here? This is all about China. I mean, but it's not. It is. Right. No, it's actually about Samaria that got to India, that came over the mountains through Dat Mo and got to China and now got here. 
-hmm. And don't ask me how Sumerians got it. <laughs> but if you look at it, that's why I keep Damo right there, to keep everyone remembering that it's not Chinese. It's actually a form of Buddhism, which then turned into Confucianism, then turned into Taoism, which was its indigenous religion because they didn't want a foreign religion dominating in their country. So I, you know, and if you really want to look at the Roman Catholic Church, which I know I'm partial to, my family is in clergy, whether you like it or not, I know a lot of people here in the Southwest think it's almost a form of uh, sorcery, because <laughs> we use frankincense and cool outfits. It's all the same stuff. They nail it all. It's all the same. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's all the same. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Son. It's technically the daughter, but we're misogynistic and no women, please. And this is the young. The daughter represents form, the trunk, the feminine. The father represents pure potential and consciousness. And chi is the Holy Spirit that connects the two. I sat, I went to seminary. I sat there. I was going to be a priest. I love women too much. I didn't make it. <laughs> but if you tried, guys, I'd look great with a white collar, but I just couldn't. <laughs> you know? So maybe next time. <laughs> but, but still, love it. It's great. In my mind, I get it completely. You, you see, so if you, whatever your tradition is, it's going to be the same root. The tree is going to look different, but same root. But we kill each other anyways over it. So, so, but it's a real, you know, key piece as we, we go through this, you know, evolutionary process to, to come back to realizing that this is a short journey. How fast did it take to get over 60? Yeah. Isn't it crazy? It goes fast. So it's a real short journey. However, it seems like it's forever, especially when you're young. I mean, I had a child, but I was 50. Think about that. Why? Well, that's what God said. <laughs> but also, you know what? I realize that it goes like this. I'm old enough to know that even though it's, he's, he's breaking my balls and he's making me nuts and he threw a diaper at me, soon he's going to be taking the keys and he's going to be gone. Yeah. So I lament his absence now yeah. because i got a pretty good relationship with impermanence by now. So I already look at him as, oh, God, I'm going to miss him so much. That's an advantage of this. And you have that. So the wisdom, the wisdom is what ultimately destroys suffering. And that is your seed. That is your contribution. And that is the greatest gift. You have the children and the grandchildren. And they talk about, you want to give people two things, love and principle. Love is giving them what they want. Principle is giving them what they need. What they need isn't always pleasant. True words are seldom kind. Kind words are seldom true. And so as the elder... You're supposed to be in that power. Let's talk about your favorite group of people, the Chinese. And uh, let's let's look at a theory. And now I'm going to go into TCM doctor mode. Okay, so indulge me. But you got to know this. There's so much wisdom in this. It's always been and it always will be. But know this. Has anybody ever seen that before? If it's upside down, it's witchcraft. If it's right side up, then it's like, like they call it Wiccan or somebody that understands uh, alchemy, right? So, yeah. Anyways, these are elements. This is wood. This is fire. I'm going to give you a quick little, you know what I mean? This is earth. This is metal. There's a relationship between this. And this is water. And hopefully this is going to make sense to you. And I know wood feeds fire, and fire creates ashes, which is earth. And from earth, I can get minerals. And from minerals, I can melt that into a liquid, which ultimately feeds wood. Can you see it? I know I'm powering through. This should take you a month to know. But I also know that fire, water destroys fire. And I know that fire basically melts metal. And I know that metal just cuts wood. And I know that wood controls earth. That's called a controlling cycle. Now let's get to the meat of the argument or point. Wood is the mother. Let's just say, what is wood's baby? Fire. You can see it, right? <laughs> wood creates fire. You throw wood into a fireplace. Okay. So the fire is baiting. Who's supposed to really manage, lead, control, and raise, and ultimately influence wood? 
you see it? Or fire. This one, so here's the mother, there's the baby. It's the grandmother. Traditionally, it is in this case, water controls fire. Water gave birth to mommy, which is mommy wood. And mommy wood had the baby boy who was very fiery, like mine. Well, who controls ultimately as the greatest influence? Grandma. And where does the, what do they call it, mitochondrial or something like that? The, where do the seeds come from? That child has your seeds, not your daughter's. You know that, right? Your eggs. And so it's how God did it. That's, this is gone. This has been cut in half, the parent, and this has been eliminated. And that's why we live in the sick, twisted world that we do. And so if I looked at the human condition just as a patient and did diagnoses, I'd be very sick. And so what would I prescribe? I'd say, okay, I gotta fix this. I gotta excess fire. Oh no, mommy doesn't get it. Mommy's giving him too much wood. This is getting crazy. This is getting crazy. What are we gonna do? This is getting crazy. High blood pressure, hypertension, heart attack, stroke. It's just a fire, 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 fire. Uh oh, call the grandparents. Get the water in here. That's how every diagnosis and prescription is made. Call the grandparents. Okay, well, if we looked at the human, it's just one entity, who would we need to call? And that's what I'm trying to say, you're the gold, the most valuable possession in the society. Because it's not the kids. You think it's the kids, but the kids are gonna basically be pulp. Pulp belongs to large intestine and colon, which is crap. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it's just pulp, it's crap. Until it's refined. So you can throw off all kinds of animal kids. Anyone could sire a child, raise one. Yeah. So this is the piece. So we're multiplying like, like, like rats, but the grandparents are gone. And that is the fundamental reason why you have this big explosion of unconsciousness. The elders are not being honored because the elders are not honoring themselves. Why? Because you probably didn't see it either. You didn't really get the, maybe there was a couple of people and those are the people you cherish in your mind that had that impact and gave you that nugget that kind of became your North Star. It was like, well, Uncle Frank said, and you know what, he was right. And one thing's good, and then you ask, what would Uncle Frank do, what would he do? And then and maybe you make the right call, thank God you went fishing over the day and he just said that one thing that changed your life. You're that person, you are the water that's kind of controlled that fire. And so whether it's your own flesh and blood or whether it's the people around you, you know, that aren't, you're not my parents, but I have to, the universe doesn't care. You're someone's parent. So I have to treat you and honor you and do the best I can. Your students, I'm lecturing, but I have to respect you because you're elders. That's how it works. And that's a universal principle that does not exist. We're to the point where we even like to punch them in the head when they're walking down the street. You can read it in the newspaper, an 80 year old woman gets punched in the face in New York. That tells you we are now in the epitome of animalness. They call that, again, Kung Tzu, a uh, human animal. When you start to see, you wanna see where society is, watch how they treat the elders. They'll, they'll tell you the whole story in a snapshot because they don't even know they're gonna be elders. They're that unconscious. And all they see is Jane. And that is basically going to guarantee suffering. So when I say you're the gold, yeah, you're the gold, but you're our gold. You're not your gold, you're our gold. And that's a really, really important piece to understand because if we're gonna change the evolution, you know, of uh, the collective, it actually, it's controlled by the grandparent. And every diagnosis and every prescription I've ever put together in TCM is based on that principle. So if it's on a gene level I'm talking about, you know, oh, God, I've had migraines. Oh, gee, I have arthritic hip. It's all this. Okay, but guess what? It's the same. Yes, it applies to the human physiology, but it also applies to the human condition and consciousness. So if you can kind of, kind of just sit with that, look for it, and realize that your life, the most important part of your life isn't, it's just really you're in the middle of it. This is when you learn the game. 
gather the equipment. But this is really when you play the game. It's a weird thing because most of us don't know that. We just think our life is over when the most important part of your life has just begun. Then your power period in your life has just begun, if you can seize it. And so it's a real important piece because the more we see this on, on a collective level, you can start to see it by, you know, kind of ripple out and ultimately remove suffering. It's not about he who gets the most stuff wins. He who plants the most seeds win. Go back to your plant analogy. If it's just fruit, it's going to rot. But hopefully that's going to drop. We're going to get seeds. And those seeds will go on and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. So what kind of seeds be the vessel and be very deliberate about the seeds of wisdom and example you plant. Because that's your karma. That's also called service to others. You don't want to lose yourself in your physical pain. You don't want to lose yourself in your suffering. Give yourself to others. When I lived with my teacher, I slept on the floor. I lived with him four years, trained with him 18 years, but lived in hell for four years. I slept on the floor. I ate kimchi. Did you ever eat kimchi? And I was raised on lasagna. In <laughs> you know what I mean? I got kimchi and rice. It was that in itself was the biggest punishment. So I'm on the floor, and it was hell. And we trained. And you'd finish at noon, which was midnight. That's what he called noon. And then he'd talk to you until about 2 or 4. And you get up and do it again. And I hated it. <laughs> really wanted to do this. Really wanted to live with the Grandmaster. And then I wanted to just die. <laughs> you know? And I was a kid at the time. I was only 22. And so, and that's when he asked me, so it looks like you're suffering. I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. So I see, that must mean you're not thinking about the suffering of others. If you're sitting around thinking about your, your students and you're putting your mind into trying to create an environment conducted to their learning, you wouldn't be lost in your own story and your own suffering. Sounds like you're pretty selfish. Build yourself, sure, so you can give yourself to others. And so it's like when you find yourself suffering at that level, that means you're lost in your own story. That means you're not planting seeds for others. Best way not to lose yourself in your own story is to give yourself to others. And at this point in life, it becomes real important. And that's also a way to ascend your own physical pain. Because when the mind is moving on this level, the body becomes light. It's literally a light body. I know this sounds weird, but we always have a choice between the heavy body, pulp, form, and stuff in the light body. Okay. Resent, compassion. Which, how does resent feel? Ugh. How does compassion feel? Happy. Energetically, one goes up, the other goes down. Thank you. If you're excited and things are moving, you get up. Hey, man, what's up? Doc, you've just found out this is your, yeah, Joe, what's going on? You got to just slow, <laughs> inhale and exhale. You know, right? You're a, the, so the shun, peace, if it's cultivated, you're like, and so you no longer identify which is form. Form is thought form. That's uh, uh, go back to the tree of knowledge. You eat from the tree of knowledge, we ate from thought form. So then for, therefore we had to wear, you know, suits, the skin. Remember? They say it's skins to wear. We were given skins to wear and sent out. The skins to wear means a heavy body. We're primarily, if you stay 51% positive, you have energetically a light body. And it shows up in the chi level, which is your meridians, and I can see it in your pulse and stuff. This good light body. And the, you can tell how they move. Stability, mobility, and grace are the most important part of your portfolio. Because you can have a Lamborghini, you can have a mansion, but you can't feel your feet. And you haven't crapped in four days. And you can't sleep. You're pretty poor to me. I'd rather live in a box. And so it's like you have to include you in your portfolio. So stability, you know, mobility, grace. Very important piece. And that's what we work on, and that's what we go through. You know, that's why you're here. Okay, that was my spiel. Questions? Repeat it. No, no that's, 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 It's not a question, but I, I spent two weeks, 16 days with my grandson in China. Um, from June to the beginning of July. And first of all, in all the parks that we got to see, 
80, 90 year old men and women moving like I, I'm 72. I looked at them and thought, there's no way I could do that. I was just blown away. Yep. And the other thing, a couple of other things, um, the grandparents uh, will pick up the children from school. Right. Oh, yeah. And have interaction yep. until, and that's just a norm. That's how we do it. But and the Western culture divides us. Everyone should have a mortgage. Everyone should have a car. Live in your own house. You live in your own house. You, you're, yeah. you're alone in this house. Yeah. And, um, you know, it just there was one gal that, you know, said things are changing here and it makes us very sad. Because it's westernizing. Because it's becoming so westernized yep. Yep. that we are now saying, where are we going to put grandma and grandpa? Right. That's your first sign. Yeah, when I was a boy back in the old days, my parents uh, and grandparents, they came from Italy, mm -hmm. and they were kicked out by Mussolini. We had olive groves, thousands of acres for hundreds, since the 1400s, our family. Wow. And so they were killed. Look, that's how it went, went socialist. And so then they ran here, and we bought a block and three stories. The grandparents were always on the bottom. When, and my grandfather did all the loans. He did all the reprimanding. My grandmother did all of the, the nurturing. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be 30 hairy Italians at the table for on Sunday mm -hmm. for spaghetti and all of that. And so I was kind of lucky enough to, it's like your grandparents ran the show. Mm -hmm. Like when they, they determined who got a car, who went to college, mm -hmm. who got a loan, and they had the money. They ran the show. And uh, that's just, uh, I thought that's how the world was until, of course, I grew up. So some cultures, you know, sometimes it's there, sometimes it isn't, but it's a crime, you know, and that's something if we can see and foster. That's why I say as an elderly person, someone in, in their years, don't be alone. There's nothing worse than being broke, sick, and lonely. Yeah. That is hell before you got there. Mm -hmm. So I make it a point, anybody that knows me, I live in a circus wagon of a life, and I have all kinds of people coming and going. I, I do. Why do I do that? Number one reason, so I cannot lose myself. When you're alone, you can lose yourself in yourself. Your story, your weaknesses, your little proclivities, your little addictions, your little stuff. Screw it. I'm going to put my pants on. I'm just going to have some coffee. You know what I mean, right? It's, you can go that far. And so sometimes you're, you're better off. It, it keeps you vigilant. It's a little bit of work, but it keeps you honest. It makes you take the shiniest side and keep it out. It's very healthy. Or at least get out. These people, they come. You guys come. You sit in a lecture. You're not sitting at home. Getting out, listening, being around, laughing is medicine. And these are not things that we were taught to value in our culture. So any other questions? Yes. What I found is the hardest thing in life to do is to change. Oh yeah. So the older you get, the harder it is. Yeah. So if you haven't done a lot, you know, and you find yourself in, in that metal area, you know, how do you change? How do you where what is it that what light bulb can come on and make you change? Yeah. Suffering. That's it. Someone hasn't changed, they haven't suffered enough. And they might need to go through a few lifetimes being subject to that same suffering until they finally get it. If you're in here or now listening to this silly stuff, you've already listened to it. I'm not teaching you one damn thing. I'm reminding you. What I say resonates. Or you won't remember it or you won't even hear it. But I never, I'm not saying anything new. I might be using words you haven't used, but I'm pointing to something you already knew intuitively. Because you kind of pick off where you left off. Yes, ma'am. Did you said TCM presentation? Did you need transcendental medicine? No, I meant traditional Chinese medicine. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oops. Good question. Any other questions? So my biggest challenge I'll share with you is, uh, you know, I again, warrior scholar sage. I started as a kid. It was all warrior. They call it Tang Zigong, virgin boy training, setting the bones, they call it. Holding these positions. So if you look at my bones, the way the muscles connect to the bone, the bones are different. Do you just see what I'm saying? You set your body. And we learn discipline. 
We learn to do things that we don't want to do because they're the correct thing to do. You start to learn mind over matter. You know, you learn to stand there and listen to a lecture from 7 a.m. till 3 a.m., you know, and you're just listening and repeating it. It's crazy stuff. And it's like, this is your mind, stronger than your body. Warrior, scholar, oh, here's some points. Acupressure point, this is this, this is how you, you got to learn the medicine. Sage, oh, here are the meditations. This is how you drop into tranquility and clarity. Warrior, scholar, sage. Warrior, Jing, scholar, understanding how energy moves through the body. Sage, understanding the nature of consciousness and reality. Those are the three phases. Okay, cool. I come here to Sun City, and people come in, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be able to teach them warrior stuff. Because you can't. I, you can't. You're not going to learn to fight with a sword or do stuff like that. You guys would cringe if you've seen the things I've done. So no, but you, you can. And what I learned is the body can go through restoration <clears throat> through the scholarly practices of traditional Chinese medicine, medical qigong. And the mind can be fostered quickly through the sage practices of meditation and basically contemplation and observation. So I put together two sweet because I came here, I, I wasn't planning on teaching you. I was at my headquarters with all the instructors and the staff and attorneys and accountants. And his name was Stan Brath, walked through. And he said, so he was from New York. He's like, so you teach old people? And I looked at him and he's walking like Quasimodo. <laughs> it took him 10 minutes to get to me. And I'm like, is he coming? Is he not coming? Is he standing? And it was like, it was really wild. And he looked at me and my, my teacher told me this. You have to uh, care for anyone that respects you. So if someone comes to you in earnest and really wants to know if you can teach them, you shut up and you teach them even if they're a train wreck. And so I apprehensively said, yeah, I always do, <laughs> which I don't. And so began, this was about 10, 11 years ago. And I started this, I said, okay, then, and more. And then I walk out, I got 47 people in the room. I'm like, oh my God, they're taking over. And you did. <laughs> and there's no more karate guys, no more fighting, where's the stuff? So, and that's okay. And so I created, uh, you know, a little bit of protocol based on you know, prescriptions for TCN and all of the common ailments, which is basically fire over water. I'll go into that in another day. But the restorative protocol is amazing. A lot of you who trains now, a lot of you train here or there, do different things. And the way the body responds to a little bit of culta, a little bit of nurturing, it explodes. It's amazing how quickly you can restore the body. And so we put together all of this stuff. And my journey has been to Come up with ways that you can quickly recapture, again, stability, mobility, and grace. So we do the qigong. We do the golden qigong. I'm always coming up with, with you know, different things. Oh, a segue. I'm putting in, uh, I'm doing a little workshop, too. On, uh, I call it, what is it? Taiji balloon. Why Taiji balloon? Because here's my problem when I do.